Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Let's Talk ABM with me, Declan Mulkeen, CMO of account-based marketing agency, Strategic ABM. ABM is one of the hottest B2B strategies right now, helping companies to win, grow and retain their most important accounts. This podcast allows me to spend some time talking to account-based marketing leaders about their ABM programs and share their insights with other B2B marketers, wherever you are on your ABM journey. So today I'm joined by Davis Potter, who's the ABM Marketing Manager for Strategic Accounts at Scale AI. Davis, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Declan. I'm very excited to, to be on the pod. Great. So let's let's kick off then. Um, a couple of things. Obviously, we were having a chat uh, in preparation for this interview a few weeks ago now, and and one of the things that struck me in, when I was looking at your kind of profile on LinkedIn was that obviously you'd worked at Pega Systems, and I was fortunate to speak to uh, to Matt Kent who who, who worked previously at, at Pega Systems on a previous episode. Let's talk ABM, and you're also at Google Cloud, and I was very fortunate also to speak to Akriti Gupta who headed up ABM there as well. So, what did you take away from those two roles, perhaps, and and the approach that they take to account-based marketing? First off, I am extremely privileged to have had the opportunity to learn from both Ocrity and Matt, and, and not only both of them, but the respective ABM teams in and of themselves. They're, they're both truly world-class. And when looking at my experience at Pega, this is where I went really deep in one-to-one ABM. So when I joined the the marketing side was very much more demand focused right and we flipped the whole the whole segment over to account based marketing and so you know thinking through the key takeaways that that experience brought the first one that comes to mind is when you have such a massive abm team having a strong center of excellence is crucial you know having consistent templates, consistent ways of speaking to sales, speaking to the business, and and even best practice sharing. When you've got your team over in APAC and your America's team, what are they doing over in APAC that we could leverage in America that we're maybe not thinking about? The second thing uh, is definitely how each industry is different, right? And, And so allowing the ABM practitioners some autonomy in how they practice ABM, not just within different regions, but even within the same uh, geographical region, Um, you know, having a loose structure and and some fundamentals to follow, but also giving that autonomy is is definitely something that worked really well. And then the third, this is where personally, I was able to see how ABM has such an impact on revenue. And also how it's not linked to, you know, one specific piece of the funnel. Now, flipping it over to the Google Cloud side, um, this was definitely a different experience from Pega as, you know, the team was smaller. Um, We were really deep in one to few ABM. This is where the majority of my experience on the one to few side came from. And... Key takeaways from this, uh, the first is your cross-functional ecosystem. It is imperative to success. And if you're able to stand up a really strong one, it is going to make your life as an ABM practitioner 10 times easier. Um, And another one of the key takeaways that, that kind of falls seamlessly with this is if you need and are looking to execute extremely quickly, without sacrificing any of you know, your, your program quality, that cross-functional ecosystem, that is going to be absolute gold. Um, and then the third takeaway is having a great SDR team. If, you know, if they're right on board with your vision, they're extremely bought in, it's just a cheat code. And especially for the one to few side, I was just, um, Davis, I was just making feverish notes there, actually, just to make sure I was capturing everything, because I think that's a, I think that's a great um, list. Um, I'm actually, actually, if it's okay with you, I was going to t- touch on a couple of things you mentioned, actually, there, Davis. Um, you mentioned at PEGA, the Cent- ABM Center of Excellence. For those listeners who aren't that familiar with, with what a COE, uh, um, a Center of Excellence is, can you paint us a brief picture of what that is? When I think of a Center of Excellence... 
what comes to mind is it's almost like the operational wing of your account-based marketing program, helping to drive you know best practices from a templatization, from how you speak on ABM, from your MarTech stack, how you even you know collaborate and communicate with the sales teams, um, just, just driving, you know, consistency and also taking in what's not working right at, at Pega being such a large account-based marketing and, and very mature program, it, you'd have some commonalities in terms of what wasn't working across the different regions. And, you know, before we really had a, a strong COE, there were different things that weren't working or things that were working um, that the teams just weren't sharing. And so when we, when we implemented the COE and, and a few practices around this, um, such as, you know, we'd have, um, oh, I'm blanking on the term. We, uh, it was like almost like a round table where we'd bring in different ABM practitioners from uh, different regions, all from different levels, and we chat through, you know, what's working well, what's not, what's on your wish list. And the funny thing is, is you tend to see, you know, the same things pop up from your Europe side to, to the Americas. And, and we compile that list and that's where we'd really go deep into what are the priorities to help fix and, and where are the priorities on the wish list that we should really uh, look to implement. And in terms of the, the the center of excellence, did was it just marketers who had access to that, or was it actually available to the to the wider sales team or, or, or other people in the organization? So, this is uh, something that we were just looking to stand up, and and I'm sure that they they carried this through past my time. But involving sales in some of those conversational chats around what's working and, and not working is something that you know, I, I think was going to make a huge difference, especially getting their perspective, um, because I'm sure it, it would be the same across the regions as well, where they would have some of the commonalities. And, and that's where we could pull from our, our list on initiatives also. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And then just to, to mention, when you mentioned Google Cloud there, what was interesting, I love that expression, a cheat code. You were talking about having a great SDR team. Tell us briefly what the importance of having that SDR team plugged into the ABM motion. You're, the, having an awesome SDR team is unbelievable. Um, and it makes your life on the ABM side so much greater, easier, and also allows for your program to execute at such a higher level. When you know they're very much bought, on, bought in, they can do some of the outreach in the accounts that you can't really do from a personalization standpoint um, and they can help provide feedback on the program that maybe you're not hearing or collecting as there's, you know, chatting with, with key contacts all the time. So from a messaging standpoint, from a outreach standpoint um, and from, you know, overall insights, they, they really have a great pulse. Well, I think we'll talk maybe a little bit about sales later in the conversation, um, Davis, but it, um, it's fascinating to see what you've learned both from Pega and from Google Cloud, two companies that are both um, leading the way in their in the approach they have to account-based marketing. So let's talk about where you are now. Obviously, you're at um, you're heading up ABM at Scale AI. Um, now, Scale, I think when we were talking, you were saying that Scale AI, Scale AI rather is a classic startup. What would you say is probably the greatest difference when doing marketing and ABM at a startup as, as opposed to working at Pega or at Google Cloud? When thinking about some of the challenges, um, the first thing that is probably coming to your mind and in all of the listeners' mind, budget size. And this is very much true. Um, on the startup side, you definitely do not have the dollars to execute that you would at you know that, that larger organization. And so some of the challenges that come with this are investment and the ability to bring on some MarTech solutions. Um, you have to get really specific in event sponsorships and, and where you put your dollars, along with content curation and, and a lot of other pieces on the tactical side. 
Um, another challenge that comes to mind is resources for sure. Not having, you know, as many agencies able to support the program um, and also cross-functional support from both a headcount and program maturity and depth perspective. Um, and, and the third thing is also uh, headcount from the ABM team side. When thinking about what has worked really, really well in the startup space, the first thing that, that definitely jumps out is being able to align the teams. And this is mainly due to the size, right? There's not as many people. So it's really easy to bring the full sales team together uh, and the cross-functional ecosystem and be able to drive some of the, the initiatives. Um, second piece is moving quicker. There are less roadblocks. So if you have an idea or you need to iterate, you can do this pretty quickly given there's less red tape and, and internal processes to go through. And then the third piece is bringing in new MarTech or an agency. We might not have the budget to bring in a, a bunch all at once, but one of the main things that has been awesome is that we can bring them on really quickly versus having a, a very long um, time for them to go through security checkpoints and, and make sure that they're integrating with you know, the massive legacy or massive internal systems because um, it's just so much smaller in, in the startup space. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. Um, if I play that back to you, what you're saying in effect is that in a startup space, you can be more agile and potentially more innovative in your approach um, because you can get people together because it's a small organization. You can move quicker and obviously you can onboard agencies or other resources or MarTech without perhaps all the documentation and legal forms and everything else you have to go through when working for a much, much, much larger organization. But on the on the other side, on the flip side, you obviously have issues around resources. You can't necessarily do everything you'd like to do. And you can't obviously, you have to be quite careful where you put your marketing dollars, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the program there. So when we were speaking earlier, Davis, you were telling me that, you know, within a relatively short space of time, I think it was three months, you managed to launch quite a large part of your ABM strategy. Um, can you share, you know, uh, how you went about this? What, what, if you, let's, let's, let's start at the very beginning. So you landed in Scale AI, you opened up your Apple Mac. And you said, right, let's let's start an ABM strategy. How, how did you how did you what was your thinking? So the first thing that I wanted to do was listen, learn, gain a grasp on how the business operates um, and think about, you know, what would drive the greatest business value from an account-based marketing, uh, account marketing program to start. Um, and so this was a lot of meeting with our sales and go-to-market leaders um, across all roles to really gain that, you know, fundamental understanding of, of what's going on at scale. The second part was to meet with our cross-functional leaders, right, from a marketing standpoint um, and, and start to build that ecosystem and, and learn who is going to be some of the key partners and also start to, to chat with them around what ABM will look like and, and really plant the seed of how it's different from your traditional growth or, you know, demand gen. After doing this, um, figuring out how ABM will align to the business needs. And this was really thinking through and, and chatting with uh, our marketing leadership and our sales leadership around what we need and how we should approach the different flavors of ABM, which one we should ultimately pilot uh, first. After doing this, um, it was, you know, let's start at least a first iteration of an ABM center of excellence. So drafting out your initial ABM playbook, what is this going to look like? What is your go-to-market strategy going to be? For us, we have a nine-step 
strategy um, and, and touching on those steps really quickly. First, we set our ABM objectives. After this, we gather account intel, determine the ABM play, build our custom messaging house, draft some stakeholder mapping, uh, then ultimately we'll build the ABM plan, execute it, measure, and refine and optimize. Um, and this is very much focused on our one-to-one -one, uh, side of the, of the house. Also in the ABM Center of Excellence, thinking through how we can build some repeatable go-to-market templates. Um, given that you know, our account-based marketing program is so new, we're in the pilot phase and we want to ultimately expand this, um, having a, a strong foundation of templates that uh, when we ultimately, you know, expand the team can pull from and use, um, this was really huge. And then understanding what we have and what we don't have in our tactical toolbox. Um, and then really creating that list of, of the gaps that we need to fill after working on the ABM COE. Then uh, taking a turn and, and chatting with our marketing ops and, and analytics teams around what a time frame and what a first pass at an ABM analytics dashboard would look like. Um, and starting this conversation really early because ABM analytics, it's, it's definitely something that has always taken a while. And it's something that the business isn't necessarily used to, um, given that we have, we have different metrics such as contact engagement, measuring the three R's. Um, and then after, you know, having that conversation and, in the previous steps, the last thing was to educate and socialize with the greater teams around what we ultimately would like to do and launch from an ABM perspective. I mean, that was a, a long, I mean, what I was thinking when you were explaining that, Davis, was you were, the amount of work involved and at the same time you managed to get something up and running within three months. So that's, that's you know, a, quite an amazing achievement to do all that planning, preparation, get everybody on board and at the same time get some form of strategy up and running, some form of campaign up and running. Let me ask you a question there, Davis. Did you, um, was there a previous attempt at ABM at scale at AI or were, was it new when you joined the company? Did you bring it to the company? So this was our first time having an account-based marketing function. Um, and so, you know, starting it from the ground up uh, at scale AI, which, which has been really fun. So that, that that makes it even you know more more um, rewarding really the fact that it's obviously starting from the ground up, and you're bringing something new to an organisation that obviously in a startup mode is obviously keen to to generate revenue, generate ARR, generate very quickly um, repeatable revenue, right? So let, let's talk a little bit more about the ABM program there. Um, talk us through what what was your thinking around the. Um, around the industries that you selected. What was your thinking about which industries you should go after and why? Our go-to-market strategy made this incredibly easy from an account-based marketing standpoint. Um, what we ultimately landed on is piloting a one-to-one -one program and also a one-to-few to start. Um, and our long-term vision is you know launch ABM in three phases. First, your pilot phase, then your standardized phase, and then scale. So when focusing on the industries, um, the way that our business is set up, we have four primary accounts that are, you know from a go-to-market focus, our top priorities. And all of these accounts, uh, actually align to the same industry. So from, from an ABM standpoint, it was like, wow, this, this is perfect. So we're running one-to-one -one ABM within those four. And then from a one-to-few perspective, this is where um, you know, we really wanted to go deep in a industry or a product that made a lot of sense and had a lot of commonalities across these accounts. Um, from a funnel perspective, and then also from, you know, what would make sense uh, uh, from a program where we could leverage some scale. So 
after having some conversations with our go-to-market team, our marketing leadership, and then also diving into some data, th that's how we were able to land on uh, the different accounts and the different industry segments. So, so to summarize, the one to one to one is focused more on. Would that be more on existing customers? That the one to one is that customers that you wish to grow more? Definitely. So the one to one is focused on existing customers, and the one to few is very much focused on uh, greenfield accounts. Green, green, greenfield. Okay, and then. Um, and I think what was interesting there was you, you talked about the data. What can you just shine a light on data? What kind of data would you pull in order to make those decisions? So we wanted to make sure that anywhere that we put our resources, given that they're relatively scarce and in everything that we do, we want to make sure it's going to have the, the greatest business impact. Um, some of the things that we wanted to look at were What's the total addressable market within these accounts? How does our product or, or our program align to this? Um, a few of the pieces that, that we didn't quite have very mature, um, but ultimately we'll, we'll look at in the future are what does contact engagement look like? Um, are we you know, talking with the right people currently? What does, what does that buy-in group engagement um, tell us. Also, you know, from a, a Greenfield and revenue perspective, um, are they existing customers or, you know, what have conversations been like within these accounts? Um, and so those, those are a few, a few points that, that we wanted to look at or we'll definitely explore in the future. And you mentioned, obviously, what's interesting, obviously, is you've chosen a one-to-one -one into a select number of existing customers, which makes perfect sense. Then you've selected a smaller group to go into your one-to-few. For the time being, you, I don't think you've stood up any one-to-many. Is that correct? We haven't, but that is absolutely on our roadmap. In terms of the, the next stage, in terms of the piloting, the standardization, and then the scaling, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yep. And so, so can you, can you share, uh, sorry, go ahead, Davis, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go, you go. I'm getting a bit of a lag over okay, on sorry. my side. I was going to ask you, <laughs> that's okay. So um, what I was going to ask you was um, with regards to, it's, it's very early days, but are there any results that you can share with us in terms of what's been achieved to date? Totally. So we were able to find some quick wins in our one-to-one -one ABM programs. Uh, and this came in the form of personalization. We had some great success with personalized ads. Uh, and this came in both revenue sourcing and generating some uh, pipeline, which was an amazing, uh, amazing quick win and, and early ABM success. Now, definitely not having the lens of this is going to be something that happens all the time, given how you know ABM is more of the long term play. But I think it was really great, especially as we're just starting our program to be able to show the business, you know, hey, this is the power of account based marketing and personalization. And, and this is just the beginning. And sorry, can, let me just ask you a question and go into that because it, that sounds really interesting. When you say personalized ads helped you to drive revenue and pipeline within your within those one to one accounts, what what exactly do you mean by personalized ads? What 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 kind of personalization were you able to achieve? So, it wasn't anything crazy robust, um, but speaking directly to these accounts on both LinkedIn and Facebook ads, uh, including, you know, their name, very relevant. Uh, for example, one of the ads that, that promoted uh, very well was uh, focused towards our strategic account and promoting a event. We have from the copy perspective, mm. from the, the creative perspective, we very much made it uh, 
pop for this account. Um, and it, it performed very well. And, and we saw the same across the board. That's, that's great to hear. That's great to hear. So let's talk about something which we mentioned at the beginning of the, the interview in terms of sales. Um, I know when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that, you know, you, you put an awful lot of time and effort and education and, and relationship building, actually, into working with your sales colleagues. And that's obviously in your past at Pega, at Google Cloud, and now obviously at Scale AI. Um, and you're, one thing that struck me when we were talking earlier is you also mentioned that there can be the case that some sales colleagues are more on board with the program than other sales colleagues in general, not necessarily at scale, but in general in your experience. What do you think you can do potentially with those colleagues that are less on board? If you have been practicing ABM for a bit, I am sure you probably run into some challenging partners. Um, and this typically comes in the form of maybe they're continuously pushing back on meetings. Um, maybe they are not executing some of the sales led tactics on time or providing some timely insights uh, into the account and are just not bought in. Um, and this can be really challenging, especially when, you know, from an ABM perspective, you're putting in so much time, effort and resources uh, into running the program. And so if you're if you run into a challenging sales partner or a challenging sales team, um, a few things that I would first recommend. One, having a strong relationship with your VP of sales, starting this in the beginning is where you'll uh, be able to leverage it for success when you find a, a challenging sales partner. Um, because your VP of sales, they might be able to explain ABM in a way that, that might make more sense to the sales team than, than you are, um, or they can really help to show how it will fall into the account plan and, and the overall go-to-market strategy. Secondly, Maybe it's just not right for ABM um, from a timing perspective, and and maybe the account or or you know few accounts might not be be a great fit. So if you have a sales partner that's not fully committed, and and maybe the accounts aren't right, my recommendation: do not be afraid to pivot and switch accounts. You will a hundred percent. Thank yourself uh, uh, later down the line, um, and you'll also be able to drive a greater business impact. I think that was a couple of great pieces of advice, and I think one thing that I, I would also add is that salespeople love success, and they 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 are, are desperate for success, and they want to learn what works, and so. I think the more that you can communicate success to those sales colleagues about the other programs you're doing with other sales colleagues, they will then want to jump on board and say, hey, give me some, give me some, give, give me some. And I think what ends up happening very often with these successful ABM programs is that you have to be careful that you, you, you don't die from your own success, right? That if they're all, if all the sales teams are asking for you to, to run ABM into their accounts, you, you may go back, going back to what you mentioned at the beginning, Davis, you may have a real resource issue because you're not able to spread yourself that thinly across so many accounts but my, my advice to anyone listening is over communicate with sales give them as much good news as possible and share their good news because that will really breed that kind of teamwork and that kind of alignment between you and your sales colleagues three rapid fire questions davis to finish off on um we often talk about abm as being a journey right and you know I don't know about you, but I've been on some terrible journeys where you know you've took a, took a wrong turn, you got lost, or whatever. Um, but what 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 um, what's been the greatest learning from your ABM journey? The biggest piece from mine is uh, don't be afraid to pivot. If an account isn't right for ABM, messaging isn't working. If you need to change, you know, some piece of the program, do not be afraid to do it um, and make those hard decisions. I love that. I love that. I think um, speaking to your ex, your ex boss, Akriti Gupta at Google Cloud, once she was saying that one of the big things at Google, one of the tenants they have is, is fail fast, learn fast. And I think that's definitely something that 
from an ABM point of view is experimentation is key not, and not being afraid to say, you know what, we were convinced that was going to work, but but it hasn't worked for the for the timing, for the for the audience, for the campaign. We just not, but it's okay to to learn from that mistake, right? And just to keep keep because you'll get better and better. So I think that's a great a great learning. Um, second question: What do you think is the hardest part of ABM? Educating and aligning the business. Um, ABM, it's it's such a prominent buzzword. And everyone is so eager to implement it from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, and across everyone's journeys, ABM can mean something different to each individual. And so having, you know, that, that single definition and continuously reminding and, and educating all along the way, um, has, has definitely been a challenge and something to to continuously go back to. Mm. Let me just throw, I just thought of, you just said something there, which made me think, let me just throw another question at you that, that I've just thought about. What do you think is the greatest misconception about ABM? ABM is ads and landing pages. It is so <laughs> much more robust than those two. Definitely, I would definitely agree. And also, I hear some people saying that ABM is all about sending Starbucks coffee vouchers, which it definitely is not, right? Yep, yep. Toss direct mail right in with those two, and and that's usually what people people think of. It's like on demand ads, on demand direct mail. But truly, doing ABM right, it is such a comprehensive, multi touch, six, twelve, eighteen month plus program, and. And that is is really where the majority of the education comes from. And, and Declan, to your point earlier around showing sales, you know, an example of this, uh, that alone can make such a uh, such a big impact. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, there, Davis. Very last question, just to finish off with: What's that one piece of advice you would give to anybody who's looking to launch an ABM program? ABM will take a village, especially if you're just starting off. So make sure you have a strong cross-functional ecosystem, have those conversations, set those reoccurring meetings, and, and you know, just make sure that everybody is aligned to that single village or to that single vi- uh, vision because ABM is not done in a silo. I think that's fantastic, fantastic advice to finish off with, Davis. Davis, thanks so much for sharing your ABM journey with us today. And I wish you and the whole team there at Scale AI every success for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me, Declan. If you enjoyed this episode of Let's Talk ABM, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Feel free to rate and review this podcast. Thanks so much for listening.